When it comes to books that challenge religion's claims, the three that the media always mentions are Sam Harris's The End of Faith, uh, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion, and Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great. And sometimes um, they'll also mention Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell, but that's generally the outer limit of the mass media's attention span on the subject. Now, organizations or associations that specialize in religious skepticism will sometimes also mention additional books, but the one book that I've um, yet to see on anybody's list of required reading for skeptics, but that I think should be in the top ten list, is a um, good book. And that's, uh, the subtitle is The Hilarious, sorry, The Bizarre, Hilarious, Disturbing, Marvelous, and Inspiring Things I Learned When I Read Every Single Word of the Bible. Um, I'll try to make that the title of this video, but um, probably have to leave out a few words to make it fit. Uh, anyway, the author is David Plotz, and he's a writer for Sleep Magazine. One of the things that I think makes this book such um, so effective at religious skepticism is that the author does not have an anti-religion agenda, because all that David Plotz is doing is reading the Bible for the very first time, and really it's just out of uh, curiosity and fascination. Um, and then he gives a summary along with commentary. Um, Plot starts out the book by saying that he's always been a proud Jew, but never a very observant one. He believes in God, uh, but says the Lord's name only to take it in vain. He rarely remembers the Sabbath, uh, never keeps it holy, and goes to the synagogue about as often and with about as much pleasure as he goes to the DMV. But then one, uh, one day he goes to a relative's bat mitzvah, and it's all in Hebrew. Uh, he doesn't understand a word. He's uh, bored out of his mind. Uh, so he picks up a nearby Torah and flips it open at random. And he lands on Genesis chapter 30, uh, 34, uh, where he says he became, uh, and I quote, immediately engrossed and horrified. He reads a story of a young man named Shechem who rapes Dinah. Uh, Dinah is the daughter of Jacob. And after Shechem rapes Dinah, he falls in love with her and he wants to marry her. So Shechem goes to Jacob and Jacob's son for permission to wed uh, Dinah. So Jacob's sons pretend to agree to go along with the marriage, but say only on the condition that Shechem and all the men of his town get circumcised. And apparently Shechem has enough charisma or political clout to, get, uh, to convince everyone in the town to go along with this. But then when all of Shechem's townsmen are incapac incapacitated from the pain of the circumcision, Jacob's sons come into town with swords and they murder all the men, all the men, take the women and children as slaves, and seize all of the town's livestock and property. Now, Jacob finally speaks up uh, for the first time and uh, complains to his son that this, this kind of behavior creates ill will among neighbors, to say the least. And the sons respond by saying, but should we let our sister be treated like a whore? And then that's it. Uh, end of story. So in addition to being engrossed and horrified with this, uh, Platz also wonders why he never heard the story before. I mean, after all, he went to um, Hebrew Morning Saturday School. Um, he thought he was given a fair overview of what's in the Bible. I mean, he was taught things about Adam and Eve and uh, David and Goliath, uh, Noah's Ark and the like. But then he adds, and I'll quote from the book here, but the founding fathers of Israel lying, breaching a contract, encouraging pagans to convert to Judaism only in order to cripple them for slaughter, massacring defenseless innocents, enslaving women and children, pillaging and profiteering, and then justifying it at all with an appeal to their sister's defiled honor? Not on the syllabus. And the tale of Dinah isn't hiding way in the back of the Bible, deep in Obadiah or Nehemiah or one of the other minor league books no one ever reads. It's smack in the middle of Genesis, the one book of the Bible even ignoramuses think they know. So Plotz decides to read the whole book and then summarize it chapter by chapter. And then he posted his summaries in Slate Magazine in a series called Blogging the Bible. Uh, and then he refined and edited those blog posts, and that's what makes up Good Book. Um, also, those original posts are still online uh, in Slate Magazine. Um, just search under the phrase Blogging the Bible, and you'll find them there. Um, anyway, so some of the things Plotz finds surprising are brand new to him, uh, like the story of uh, Dinah and Shechem, and discovering that God has a no poly blend rule. Uh, that is Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 19, uh, says, Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Uh, and he also learns that if your wife is not a virgin on your wedding night, you're supposed to have her stoned to death, um, at least according to Deuteronomy 22, verse 21. And he learns from 
chapter 5 of the book of Numbers that you can find out if your wife is committing adultery by watching how her, how her body reacts to drinking a cup of bitter water. Um, no reaction, well then she's not guilty. If her thigh sags, well, obviously then you know she's been sleeping around. Um, but what Plotz finds even more surprising than these uh, new aspects um, is discovering that the Bible stories that he thought he knew turned out only to be the, really the um, cleaned up, vanilla pudding versions of these stories. Now one example is uh, learning the details, the details behind the familiar story of the Hebrew struggle against the Egyptian pharaoh and how God had to inflict uh, so many plagues upon Egypt before the pharaoh changed his mind. Now what Plotz is shocked by is how the Bible specifies that God repeatedly says he's hardening the pharaoh's heart. So the Pharaoh really has no choice but to refuse to let the people go. God says this in Exodus uh, chapter 4, verse 21, Exodus 7, verses 4 and 13, Exodus 10, verse 20, and so on. So Plotz writes, Why would God prolong the Egyptian suffering? God tells us why. Uh, and this is from Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his courtiers, in order that I may display these my signs among them, and that you may recount in the hearing of your sons and of your sons' sons how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I displayed my signs among them, in order that you may know that I am the Lord. In other words, God is causing the plagues so that we can tell stories about the plagues. He's torturing the Egyptians so we will worship him. What kind of insecure and cruel God murders children so that his followers will obey him and will tell stories about him? This is the behavior of a serial killer. God wants the plagues to persist and worsen so that we will tell stories about them. And lo and behold, 3,500 years later, that's exactly what we do every Passover. Now, another example um, is the biblical story behind the popular Jewish holiday called Purim. Uh, and I'll discuss that in part two.